Why not use your knowledge of the future to play the stock market? We could make trillions. Why make trillions when we could make billions? A trillion is more than a billion, numbnuts. All right, zip it. You, know, you can't even zip. Maybe some people want everyone to zip it because it kind of seems people, some of them, often do not take into account the true value of billions or trillions when they get thrown around just carelessly right and left, like $600 billion in new government revenue over 10 years. That's how much the debt ceiling deal reportedly will raise. Does this really amount to much more than squat in the grand scheme of more than $16 trillion? Dollars, there it is, trillions in public debt and a trillion dollar coin or two. Could that really magically solve a debt ceiling crisis or stalemate if it comes to that? Well, Chris Martinson, author of The Crash Course, is here to talk some sense about billions and trillions and give us his 2013 forecast. There's his book, The Crash Course. You can see it right there. He also has a great series that you can watch online. Very instructive. And thank you so much, Dr. Martinson. It's always so great to have you on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again. Yeah, so let's talk about the stock market because I have to say, if you look at the macro news that I've been reporting over the last year and then I look at the gains that the stock market has seen in the last year, I go, this just does not add up. And retail investors, we know we've seen report after report of them pulling out, being on the sidelines. So the questions that you raise, which are good ones, which is the interesting questions are why are people pulling their money out of a market that they no longer trust? And then who is doing the buying? So what are your answers to those, particularly the second one? Who's doing the buying? Well, that has to be the, the $300 billion question because that's how much money retail investors have pulled out over the past two years from equity mutual funds. In preference, they've been putting their money over in money market funds or bond funds or other places where they're obviously getting a very paltry, I think, uh, unnecessarily low rate of interest thanks to Ben Bernanke. So who's doing the buying? Listen, when you have $45 billion in, in fresh treasury purchases and $40 billion in MBS purchases every month, that's money that's going into the financial We're, we're having a few problems with Dr. Martinson's audio. We're going to uh, work on getting him up. Dr. Martinson, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Oh, good, good. Okay, so just pick up when you left off. You were saying that when you have the Fed uh, buying $45 billion, add another $40 billion in MBS, when you have them buying these kinds of uh, bonds and mortgage-backed securities, that has an impact on the stock market. What, what is that? Well, it's, it's clearly driving the market higher than it should be. Look, we have the Russell 2000 hitting an all-time new high. The Dow is within a percent or two of all-time highs. Same with the S&P. But the macro data, the stuff that you've been pointing out on the show, it's just sitting there with weak retail spending, with, with all sorts of measures that are clearly saying that uh, the economy is stumbling along now with this new tax deal that's in place. $60 billion a year coming out of people's pockets. It hits just about everybody. That's a drag on the economy. And then whatever spending cuts, should any obviously materialize, that'll be another drag. So I don't see anything here on a fundamental basis that supports where the markets are, but the prices are where they are because we now know the price of everything, but I think the value of nothing. The price of everything, but the value of nothing. So then how do you look at the stock market for 2013 when, when you think about your outlook? You know, is this an indication that it's going to continue this trajectory and shake off whatever bad macro news comes our way, which is likely to happen? Or does it mean, hey, 2013, really watch out because this could really collapse. There could be a huge correction. Well... If the old maxim was don't fight the Fed, I think we have to multiply that by some whole number, maybe 10. Uh, because it, it's really, we're not just fighting the Fed at this point in time, we're, we're fighting the Fed plus uh, all of the, the leverage that, that the rest of the financial industry can provide on top of $85 billion a month. Lauren, if you told me this was going to be happening, like you teleported me here from five years ago, I would be running around with my hair on fire. Yeah. An incredible, mm -hmm. difficult environment to make any money in. A, a difficult money to market to make any money in. So then where do you advise or, or think about when you, when you talk to just normal folks about where maybe they should be thinking about investing, where they can both have their money safe in 2013, but maybe hopefully get something for it, you know, unlike these low yielding instruments, whether it's bonds or in some cases where we've seen negative yields in the last year? 
Yeah, so I'm not a big fan of bonds at this point. I think they're absolutely going to be certificates of confiscation again at some point. I'm not a huge fan of the stock market, not at these multiples, maybe in some very select sectors, but Jeff, definitely not generally across the whole index uh, universe at this point in time. Uh, commodities still look like they're, they're going to have to run at some point here because the association between commodity prices and thin air money printing, very tight in the series. That still looks good. And... Uh, as I look forward in time, I still like gold and silver here, even though they've been getting uh, some pretty extraordinary bear raids that have been going on lately. But right now, the best investment for somebody with a smallish amount of money is still in their own infrastructure, in their home, very close to home. This is a period of time where I'm worried about return of principal, not return on. And I advise people to have some powder dry at this point in time, because I do think that the chance of a downside risk here is a lot higher than missing out on a bull run. Okay, that's, that's a good warning. And I'm sad to hear that trend still be one of looking for return of capital versus return on capital. People should get some return on capital. We've had financial repression for so long, uh, especially when you look at the tax hikes that are coming. This hits everybody. Payroll tax holiday is over. This is something that affects middle class Americans. It affects, affects everybody. And of course, we hear so much about the tax increases for the top bracket of those making more than $400,000. My question the revenue that that raises is the $600 billion. You were writing about how this is kind of ridiculous. You know, what does this really mean it, it, when you look at the grand scheme of the U.S. debt and, and deficit, budget deficit problems? So let's imagine a U.S. budget deficit in the vicinity of a trillion dollars for next year. $60 billion, if all of that came next year, and it won't because this thing is sort of staggered and layered out over time. But if we even got that $60 billion next year, it represents about 5% of the deficit. So to put this in context, when we had a $400 billion deficit back at the start of this crisis, and now we've got one that's you know, more than two times larger than that, this is an extraordinary event when Washington can't even find a way to trim more than 5% of that. Now, these spending cuts, if they actually do materialize, are anywhere from 1% to maybe as much as 9% of the deficit. So the total range here is going to be in the vicinity of, let's average it out, maybe 10% of the existing deficit. That's all that could be found at this point in time. It just means that we have a dysfunctional process. As I mentioned when we were running up these massive deficits years ago, I said, listen, don't be surprised when they turn out to be permanent. Washington can find ways to spend. They have a devil of a time trying to figure out how to save. And I don't think they're going to start saving until they're forced to. Market conditions are going to have to force this at some point. But with Bernanke enabling them, that could be a while yet. So it could be a while, which is certainly a model we've seen in Japan, for example. Uh, my question for you, in the midst of this, you, t you talked about the dysfunction. One idea that we've been seeing tossed around a, a lot today, especially on the blogosphere, and by some economists, too, that I've seen actually advocate this, is this idea that the Treasury could have a trillion-dollar platinum coin, deposit it in their account at the Fed. There you go. Heidi Moore, actually, I think, summed it up pretty well when she said in her article, we can bring up the headline. She just wrote this today. People are getting real emotional about this, too. We do have it. I hope we can bring it up. But uh, she said in her article, mint the coin, why the platinum coin, or the title was why the platinum coin, it doesn't even work as satire. And she says, minting a new coin is very much in the interventionist mold of the past four years, but the Fed's programs don't require scouring the U.S. reserves for platinum and creating some unnatural currency beast. It can at least masquerade as an intellectual exercise. So at least with the Fed creating new money, we kind of have this idea of some kind of intellectual exercise going on. She's arguing, you know, with the Treasury just making this magical coin, this is just a new era of absurdity, whether people are kidding about it or serious about it. What are the actual implications of doing that kind of thing in terms of inflation and also uh, intervention? It, it would simply be for optics. So why spend the money on even $500 worth of platinum to run this coin? Just mint it out of plastic or something. It's the same exact situation we already have. The Treasury prints up these Treasury bonds, bills, notes. The Fed buys them. The Fed holds them. And then the Fed redeems all of the excess interest back to the Treasury anyway. What's the difference between doing that and the Treasury going over and just getting money directly? Well, they forego the tiny bit of interest that the Fed skims to run its operations, which, by the way, is not a lot of money. So really, there would be no difference. It's just optics. It would just be a way for Washington to say, aha, we've avoided this pesky thing called the debt ceiling through some quirk. But it would just be, it's just mental gymnastics. It's, it's just a, a more clever way. 
And this is what I'm worried about. It looks like our, our nation's seeking to be clever rather than prudent. It, it's we're looking for tricks and gimmicks rather than a fundamental addressing of the of the seriousness of the condition. The fact that you know we print money through one complicated mechanism or some quirky mechanism uh, through the treasury with a coin, it's the same process. So that's the fundamental question we should be asking, which is how much is too much? Is there a bright line in the sand that we don't dare cross? But if there isn't, how, what are we really entertaining as risks here? We've already punished savers, mm -hmm. transferred about a trillion in lost revenue to savers through reduced interest payments, transferred that same benefit over to debtors. So that's really, there are a lot of messages coming through this that are very profound, yeah. such as what's our country really stand for here? Yeah, and uh, trillion dollar coin optics, I think, would be a new low of what our country stands for. But it doesn't change the fundamentals, as you point out, or the hijinks that really are going on when you really look at what the Fed's doing. Thanks so much, Chris Martinson, author of The Crash Course. My pleasure. And still ahead, how founded are the claims of gold market manipulation? Is there more than meets the eye or not? We'll talk to Keith Weiner. He's president of the Gold Standard Institute. And we have a very important message for all of you at the end of the show. First, our closing market numbers. Sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know. I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to the big picture. I'm the worst journalist in the world. White House Soup of the Day. My favorite radio guy in Fort Lauderdale is Minestrone Chicken Sausage. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. on the move down since last October and it tumbled after the Federal Reserve minutes came out yesterday. The idea being that rumblings of an end in sight for QE among Fed members was not good for gold. Now, folks like Dennis Gartman, publisher of the Gartman Letter, writes that gold bugs who have operated on the thesis that the Fed has lost control of the money supply are in tatters. Other gold traders, according to Bloomberg, expect prices to bounce back as concerns mount that U.S. lawmakers are not doing enough to control budget deficits and people want to protect their wealth. One question that keeps coming up, we talk about it, is there more to the swings in the price of gold and silver than meet the eye or are claims of market manipulation unfounded? Well, Keith Weiner is here to talk about it. He's president of the Gold Standard Institute, CEO of Monetary Metals. He's here with his view. So thanks so much for being on the show. Welcome to Capital Account. Thanks. Good to be here, Lauren. Great to see you. Sunny, beautiful L.A. Wish I was there with that nice weather. Now, you're obviously a gold advocate, judging by your title and what I've read of your views. Uh, from what I understand, you advocate for some kind of a gold standard. Now, this puts you in the same camp as some folks who also happen to believe that the market for gold and silver is heavily manipulated. You disagree with them. Why? Yes, absolutely. First, I, I want to say I'm coming from on the same side, a friendly side to gold. Uh, at Monetary Metals, we're about producing a yield on gold, uh, earning money that way, earning real money. At the Gold Standard Institute, we're about promoting the use of gold as money. And so my criticism of the conspiracy theories comes from the friendly side saying, yes, we believe in gold, but in the mainstream, we have some perception issues. And I think these conspiracy theories are not uh, necessarily helpful. Well, what do you have that disproves them? Why, why do you disagree with them, discount them as conspiracy theories? 
Okay, so um, I brought a couple of graphs. Can we put those on the screen? Yeah, we can skip down to those. So if we could take up the, the graph where the gold price overlay with a number of gold futures contracts. We have that so, up right now. So what do you think that this shows? I think, I think it's important for people to understand when a, uh, so this is a graph showing the number of, the open interest that's called the number of gold contracts, uh, contr contracts excuse me, outstanding. Mm -hmm. There's the green line and then the gold price overlaid mm -hmm. with the yellow line. I think it's important for people to understand that when you sell, there are two different ways of selling a gold future. There is a sell to close. So if let's say you bought a future on speculation because you thought the price was going to rise and then the price starts to go uh, against you, you sell that contract and that uh, is going to close that contract. Chances are the other party on the other side will buy it back uh, and then they make a profit on that. The other way is of course what's alleged in the conspiracy theory which is you could create another contract out of thin air and sell it. So what this graph is showing, if you put that back up on the screen for a moment, yeah, sure. is that according to the conspiracy theory, the price falls because the big banks are uh, creating new contracts and selling them. But what we see is as the price is falling, and particularly I want to focus on the latter part of December. Mm -hmm. When I put this together, this was the most recent price drop in gold. Um, I didn't have a chance to see the, the price action this week when I prepared this material. But we see that the, the open interest, the number of gold contracts is falling. Mm -hmm. And that suggests that it's what I call naked longs. People who speculate with leverage on gold futures are buying their contracts back, mm -hmm. or excuse me, selling their contracts. And that's why we see the open interest uh, declining. Okay. And so the, the, the conspiracy theory doesn't fit the data. So let's look so at what it. I, what I suggest, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, finish your thought. What I suggest is that people think of this a different way than the, the conspiracy theory says, well, the banks are naked shorting it, and they present the banks as having a lame excuse, well, we are hedging our, our metal. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you buy the metal and hedge it? Mm -hmm. So what I suggest that people consider is that the banks aren't hedging their metal. They're arbitraging in order to make a profit. The banks are captive like everybody else to Wall Street, and they have to have a good quarterly earnings report. And so what the market is doing is it's saying, okay, to anybody out there that has credit available to them, you can buy a gold bar mm -hmm. and simultaneously sell a future against it in order to make a profit for carrying that bar, holding that bar. And so I think it's important, and this is my second graph, to take a look at the difference between, or the spread between the futures price and the spot price yeah. which is called the basis. Yeah, so let's bring this up. So this is this shows the gold price, and it's overlaid with what you just explained is the basis, which is the spread between the price of gold futures and the price of gold metal in the, stock, in the spot market. So how does this show there is not manipulation going on in the market as you contend? So f first of all, it's really interesting to note, this is, so the basis is quoted as an annualized percentage. Mm -hmm. This is what a bank can earn by buying spot gold in any given day, you can see the, uh, that green line shows the other value. And it roughly is between 0.6% and 0.65%, uh, pretty much. Now, then that's for, hold, that's for buying spot gold, uh, let's say, on the 18th of December 2012, and selling a 20, December 2013 gold contract. So it's roughly one year. So by comparison, if, if the bank were to buy a one-year uh, treasury security, those things yield less than 0.2%. Mm -hmm. So from the bank's perspective, it's simply much more profitable to carry gold than it is to carry a, uh, a one-year uh, treasury note or treasury bill. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that graph shows is that if the banks were, so the conspiracy theory says the banks are selling um, futures naked. Mm -hmm. If that were true, then what, and, and, and driving the price down, as you can see from the gold line, you know, the price has, has been dropped over $100, certainly from September. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, peak to trough from mid-November to uh, December over there is almost $100, $80, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, if that were true, that would push that green line down because the banks are only selling a future. Mm -hmm. They don't have, especially in silver, they don't have the silver to sell. So they're selling only the future. That would drive the price of the future right, right you know, $100 down while the spot price is still holding steady. So that green line, that spread of future price minus spot price would fall completely off the bottom of that graph uh, and become negative, and it which is, is called it, backwardation. I was gonna say, that's what's called backwardation. I, I know we don't have a lot of time to get into that, but, but you're arguing that, that here, um, what's the relevance of it? Just a simple explanation. 
Well, it's, it's just like in physics, you know, when Einstein says uh, that gravity is going to bend light a certain way or something like that, you like to get to the point where you can then observe real data and say, well, if the theory is true, we're going to see light going to the left, and if the theory is false, we're going to see right, light going to the right. Mm -hmm. So we now have a situation where if this theory was true, whenever the price dropped and the, and the conspiracy theorists say that it's manipulation, we should see the basis completely falling off a cliff into the abyss, mm -hmm. and we don't. So what I would suggest to viewers is on our website, monetary-metals.com, mm -hmm. we're going to have a follow-up piece for viewers where we can present a lot more information about backwardation and, and go into more depth than we can uh, in, in a short Interesting. Clip on, and quickly, on I, I just have 30 seconds left, but what do you attribute the drop in gold recently to, if not to manipulation? What's your theory if you have one? 20 seconds, too, I got you have here. Um, that's interesting. I and mean, obviously, everybody enjoys having an opinion, and myself included. I think we have to resist the urge to say that every blip in the market has to have a, an easily point-outable reason that we can say, oh, well, that's it. Uh, personally, I suspect that liquidity conditions are getting tighter, both in China and in Europe, and people have to liquidate assets, especially where there's a firm bid, as there is in gold and silver, mm. uh, versus you know bonds in, in Europe and other things where it's much harder to liquidate. So they find whatever's not nailed down, and they liquidate it, and you, know, you see these sell-offs. I think going forward, mm -hmm. it's obvious that the price of gold and silver is going to continue to rise. We shouldn't cheer that because that's really not gold going anywhere. That's the dollar going down. Yeah, because um, a great and point. Secondly, we should. We're going to have to end it there. We're out of time. I didn't mean to cut you off, but you got so much great insight in there. I really appreciate you being on the show. Really interesting stuff. Alrighty, thank you. Take care. You too.